word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord, and as we have been reminded of your faithful promises and how you meet us here in this place, Lord, we, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide and lead us here once again as we study your word to see you a little bit more clearly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in preparation for this sermon, I found myself going down this meme trail. I don't know if anybody says this. Maybe I'm making this up right now. But um, you know what a meme is, right? It's like a a picture that has some words on it that has some jokes and stuff like that, all right? And I found myself like looking at a bunch of these pictures that were expectation versus reality. Can I show some of them to you here this morning? I I think this one is pretty good here. Um, Expectation versus reality of doing any project in our home new, in our new home together. What we expect is that we're going to be like that celebrity couple that you see on TV, right? That's able to transform something that's just a dump and turn it into something that's beautiful, But the reality of what we experience is more like Ross and Chandler from Friends, if you know this reference, right? And just moving a couch and in the process of moving a couch, you're screaming and yelling at each other. Here's the second one, expectation versus reality. New Year's resolutions. Expectation, right? This is just going to be great and fun. It's a new year, 2024. It's the year to get it done. Reality is, is that we're more like the guy on the couch. I don't know how he rests the remote on his belly like that. It's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, By the way, you're like seven days into that New Year's resolution. How's it going? Expectation or reality here? Uh, How about this one? Expectation versus reality. Salary or even like your first check. The expectation would be that you're just rolling in the dough. But the reality is, is that you're rolling in the change. Maybe that one hits a little bit too hard. It's not funny, right? But we do this all the time. What I mean by this is is we we create expectations. We, We set these kinds of expectations on all kinds of things. We do this all the time in our lives. And those expectations get attached to certain things that we see, words that we hear, and there may be personal experiences that we've gone through where we can really relate to those statements. Or there are history that we've read about, and that's what shapes our expectations, or our friends have told us that this is what it really is like. We do this all the time in our lives. And what we want is reality. We don't want to just live in expectation. We want reality. So when I ask you this question, or maybe put this statement in front of you, that that Jesus is king, which is what we're talking about here today, that Jesus is king, What are some expectations that you set on that statement? There's this uh, author, uh, pastor, he's a cultural commentator. He's written a number of books. His name is Mark Sayers. And and he writes a lot about, um, in particular, Western culture and Western religion in particular. He himself being a Christian. And he said this statement one time that I've never been able to shake. It's this statement that I want you to hear here. He says this, that we want the kingdom without the king. We want the the benefits of of the kingdom. We want eternal life. We want hope. We want joy. We want peace. We want to be loved. But we want that without the king. 
the one who promises to bring those things into this life. And I think one of the reasons that this quote just hit so hard for me and why I think he's right is because we've, we've created these expectations of what a king is. We think that a king is someone who is just uh, selfish and only thinks about themselves, someone who's isolated and doesn't really understand what it's like to be me. We, we think of kings that, that think only about themselves at my own expense. But let me tell you about the reality of who King Jesus is. He's better than the expectations that we've created for kings. So would you join me in opening up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2 here, this text that Julie beautifully read for us here today. In Matthew chapter 2, we get this image of of Jesus as the coming king. And I'm going to give you three statements here today that I'd love for you to write down that go back over. Because what we're going to see here is that Jesus is an unexpected king in three different ways from this text. So Matthew chapter 2, it says this in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Stop there for a second. You have to see that Jesus is born into a time and place when there is a king who is ruling and reigning. And this guy, Herod, he, he plays out all of the expectations that we have for a king. He's a horrible king. He's one who isolates himself from the people. If you were to go to the Middle East today, you can go and visit numerous palaces that Herod had built for himself. And he built them for himself at the expense of all the other people. I mean, how did he build these castles and palaces? Well, he was heavily taxing the people during that time. He was a king who fit the expectations that we thought or what we think a king should do. And we also read here as it continues on that Herod himself is also incredibly insecure at the news that this new king has come. Only thinking about himself, it goes on in verse 3. It says that when Herod the king heard this news, he was troubled. He's troubled because he's just thinking about himself in this moment in time. And interestingly, Matthew records, and all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. Why would Jerusalem be troubled at the news, especially Jerusalem of all places? This is where like the capital city for the Jewish people, the king of the Jews is coming. Why would they be troubled? Well, don't you know that when you're under the jurisdiction of an unhealthy king, that's unhealthy for everyone who is under that king's jurisdiction. But Jesus shows up as a king. That's the first thing I want you to see in this text. That Jesus is an unexpected king in the way he rules. We see this right off the bat in the life of Jesus. I mean, if you were to go back to Matthew chapter 1 or or go back to Christmas Eve when we were talking in Luke chapter 2, you you see how Jesus enters into this world. The God who created everything takes on flesh and walks into this world. He enters into this world in an incredibly humble way. A way that we would never think that a king would enter into the world. And not only that, in the way that he enters into the world, but the ministry that Jesus would live would be one that would example humility over and over and over again and who he would speak to, how he would act, and who this kingdom is for. In fact, Jesus would teach this in Matthew chapter 20, these beautiful words. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your bondservant. This is just flipping the whole understanding around of what we typically think about power. 
But even as the Son of Man, Jesus talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, greatness in Jesus' kingdom is found with great humility and service to others. The way that Jesus rules as a king is different and unexpected. Now, one of the other expectations that we have for kings is that, that while they are great and, and, and as kings, they also typically have great armies. That's what makes their kingdom expand. And in having great armies, that means that you have great enemies as well. So, so who is Jesus' kingdom for? Well, this is the second thing of where Jesus is an unexpected king for an unexpected people. Did you hear who came to worship this King Jesus? The text tells us that that these magi from the east have now come a great distance to worship this king of the Jews. This is what the text says here in verse 1. It says, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Julie did a wonderful job of reading this text because that word behold is actually a word that is emphatic in the original language. Matthew, the author of this text, is writing to a Jewish audience. And when they would hear that these wise men, these magi who have come from the east, this would have been shocking to the original hearers. Behold, magi from the east have come to worship this king, Jesus a group of people that you wouldn't expect to be a part of this kingdom. Now we've done all kinds of things as we typically do of where we've turned these magi into like three kings. You've maybe heard the song before, right? Don't do that. It was something that was brought into circulation in the 6th century. They weren't kings, they worked for kings. And then, like the text says here, that they were wise men, but they really weren't that wise. That was not something that was brought into circulation until the 8th century. I'd love for you, if you got your Bible, and you're going to like say, really, the pastor's going to tell me to change something in my Bible? Yeah, I want you to like put the original word that's there. The word that's there originally is this word, magi. It's three magi, or not even three, sorry. It's multiple magi have come to worship this king. And magi is short for magicians, astrologers. It's these people who are so unexpected that would come from a great distance, but now have come to worship this king, Jesus. This would have been shocking. And it should move us today as well to see how Jesus himself is an unexpected king in the way he rules Unexpected in who this kingdom is for. And lastly, I'd love for you to write this down. The third thing. If Jesus is an unexpected king in this. That he is an unexpected king in unexpected places. Jesus, conventional wisdom would have thought that that this king of the Jews would come to the capital, the temple, which is Jerusalem, which Herod himself like calls out. He's like, well, where, where is this king? If you look at the text, it, it says this. It says that Herod assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He gathers all the scribes and all the Pharisees and he says, where is this king supposed to be born? And they told him that he will be born in Bethlehem. What was prophesied and told came to be true. A real place, Bethlehem. A place that you can go and visit to this day. Just like Jerusalem. 
Bethlehem, a town that is seven miles away from Jerusalem, just off the distance of Jerusalem. A place that in 2016, I had the opportunity to go and visit and go and see with my own eyes. I got to go and study for about three weeks over in the Middle East and, and got to go to Jerusalem, Galilee in the north. And, and one day or we went down into Bethlehem. And if you know anything of what makes up this area and region today is to cross over from Jerusalem into Bethlehem, you can see, puts you out of the country or the state of Israel into Palestine. In 2016, there was lots of security and all kinds of things to cross over was not just a simple thing to do. But... We did it. We wanted to go to Bethlehem. And so, so we went to Bethlehem, and one of the places that we went to was the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Palestine in Bethlehem. It was an amazing place, a, a beautiful church that's over there. In fact, I got my picture taken there while I was there. If you want to look up there, if you can kind of see it, that's me with a baseball cap on being a stupid American. Uh, the people said I could do it, all right? I said, don't worry, I'm a pastor, all right? That doesn't get me much pull anywhere, but there they let me stand in the pulpit. And, and when I was over there, I was just blown away by the beauty of this place. A, a beautiful sanctuary that exists over there, and I started to contemplate and think about with the people who were there with us of the fact that this city, this town was the place of where our Lord and Savior has come. For me. Now I don't tell you this to like brag about my international travels. I tell you this for this reason. I think you've been following the news and you've heard about the war that's happening right now in Israel and Palestine. It's a really challenging place to be right now. And things have been blowing up and things are terrible of what's happening and going on in that place. It's a hard place to be right now. And their pastor at this church, the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, for the Christmas season this last year, when we traditionally bring trees out and we pull out our manger and our stable, but one of the things we also bring forward are these nativities. And the pastor at this church, the same church that I got to visit in 2016, put together a nativity that looked like this. It's entitled, Jesus Under the Rubble. What you see in this image here is you see the classic nativity scene. All of the characters and pieces that are there. Except covered over in rubble. But Jesus, the Christ, God with us, the one who has come to save us from our sin is in the midst of it. He is this rock, this firm foundation that doesn't run away from challenging circumstances but promises to be with us in them. And we see this fully lived out by Jesus coming into this world, living this perfect life that we could not live, dying on a cross, rising again, for us to bring this firm foundation. The pastor put together this nativity as a remembrance of who our God is in the midst of the rubble. But let me tell you that this image is not just something for a group of people in Bethlehem. It's an image for you and me as well. In the midst of rubble and trial. 
in the midst of our challenges, in the midst of when reality is not fitting the expectations that we have. God's promises are still true. He meets us in the midst of the rubble. Which is why over the next five weeks, and I don't typically do this, but I want to invite you to come back to church for these next five weeks. Because we're going to be talking about Jesus being the rock. Uh, this life on the rock. And in this sermon series, we're going to be looking at these uh, foundational pieces of who Jesus is and how he calls us to live a life with him. Jesus would go on to say in this teaching in Matthew 5 through 7, he says beautifully this, that the wise man is like a person who builds their house on a rock. That when the winds come, when the waves come, when the rubble comes, they have a firm foundation in the midst of the storm. And the unwise person, Jesus says, is like the one who builds their house upon a sand that they get wiped away by the troubles of this world. And in this series, what we're going to be looking at is these specific teachings of Jesus that aren't about salvation. Salvation has been won through Jesus' death and resurrection. It is a gift for us. Amen? Amen? But he also calls us to continue to follow him, to be wise in this world. Because I think Mark Sayers is right. We want the kingdom without the king. But let me tell you here today as clearly as I can, this is not how God's kingdom works. These two things hold together. And I pray that you would see here today that the king that we are worshiping is not like every other king that we have these expectations on. He is one who is this unexpected king in the way he rules and who he is for and where he meets us. But he is the king who lays down his life for us. The king who brings great promises for people who are in the midst of war. The king who meets us in this place where reality is not meeting our expectations. The king who promises a kingdom from a king who dies and rises again for you and me. In Jesus' name. Amen.